Hello everybody and welcome, my name is Ursa Ryan and I am doing another one of my Civ 6 tutorial guides. This time we are going to be using Rome to, well, basically go through the A to Z, turn 1 to whenever you eventually hopefully win, process in how to win a diplomatic guide. Now I will tell you a little bit about what we're going to be doing, but if you want to play along with me and you are playing on a console or want to do it this way, this is the map siege. You can pause the game and have a little bit of a sort of look at that. We are playing a standard speed emperor map because we want it to be difficult, but not so difficult that we're having to look at deity strategy. This is just a strategy for the victory type. I will do another deity guide specifically for that at a later point. Um, this is a continents and small islands map and every single uh, six player and every single detail is left identical. So hopefully if you just load up standard um, continents plus islands, put this seed in, don't change any of the settings, you should get it. But if you want a more accurate way of getting a save file, and especially if you play on PC, go to my Discord, the link is below. I keep the save files on Discord. You can just go in, save the, dis uh, the actual save file to your computer and play this exact game. Hey, you can actually join in and, and, and do better than me and tell me everything I did wrong. The purpose of this guide is to go through absolutely everything you need to think about when you win a diplomatic victory. Now, of course, there are going to be little bits and pieces that inevitably we end up missing. If I do, then feel free to leave anything in the comments. The first video will mostly be me just talking about guides and strategies. What I will then be doing is actually playing through the game with everything we've spoken about kind of in mind. So if you want to just sort of get a lot of guidance, watch the first video. If you want to just actually see a game be played, then watch the whole thing. Um, I'm really hoping you guys enjoy it. it. We seem to have had a good reception to the other diplomatic uh, sort of victory guides we've done. We've already done one for science, culture, domination and religion. And I've also got deity guides up at the moment, specifically for deity strategy on domination and science. Uh, I will be doing culture, religious and diplomatic deity guides as well. Now, just in all of the other guides we've been doing, we are playing as Rome because Rome are a just really fun as a sieve. I love the additional monuments building it's just it makes me smile the extra roads just between all your cities is fantastic and the bath actually makes you build aqueducts and you should be building aqueducts in every city regardless it's the best district and it's really really good but it's actually really good to well push us towards doing that but we're using Rome because Rome are not particularly suited to any victory type over another yes Legions give them a little bit of an early game combat bonus, and you could argue that the bath helps with the industrial zones, which may help with science and domination victories later on. But Rome, and I think we've proven this, Rome can be used to win any victory because they don't change the way the game works. There's no way of changing how the districts sort of stack together. There's no game breaking changes like Mali, for instance, that don't have any production, but have loads of gold. Rome are pretty middle of the road. And I'm kind of hoping that we're going to be using them without really paying too much mind to their actual specifics of, of their sort of unique abilities. We're going to be playing this very straight laced and showing how diplomatic uh, victory can be won by absolutely any sieve on any map with any person. With the exception of science victories, just like with culture, domination and religion, Diplomatic victories are made harder and easier depending on the size of map you are on. We are going to be playing as the standard sized map as it comes in Civ 6, which is a six player map. That's the size of game that really the game has sort of been engineered as a sort of neutral point. If you play with more players, it's still possible, but it becomes harder. If you play with less players, it becomes easier. Although the less players you have, the more you've got to worry about somebody sneaking in a culture or a religious victory under your nose. Frustratingly, um, there is no Civipedia uh, page to diplomatic favour, but getting a diplomatic victory is all about getting diplomatic favour. Uh, the sort of first half of the game we're going to be focusing on draining as much of that favour from the AI as possible and using it in order to go to the World Congress and win basically every vote we can get our hands on. Towards the second half of the game, it's about generating large amounts of it ourselves and then engineering how the game works a little bit. But diplomatic favour is all about like how we are going to progress. And well, there's multiple ways you can get diplomatic favour depending on what government you are in. So at the moment, um, unfortunately, it's not going to show us because we're on turn one, but we are currently a chiefdom, I believe. Um, it's very difficult to actually tell. Uh, let's just double check. If I go to policies, 
Oh no, we haven't unlocked any policies, have we? I believe we're a chiefdom, which means we get zero diplomatic favour per turn. As soon as we go to the tier one government, I think we've got classical republic, we've got um, oligarchy, and we've got the other one, uh, hang on, autocracy. That was it. I was looking at this thinking, I know this inside out. I've played this game about 50 times, but when you actually think about it, you totally forget. Anyway, the tier one governments offer you one point per turn. The tier two governments offer you two points, tier three, three, and then the tier four governments offer you four points. The second is to form alliances. Alliances unlock with the civil service civic, which is um, well a little bit far down the tree. Actually, we're just sort of jumping between things here, aren't we? But here we go. Down here in the medieval era, you unlock alliances. For every alliance you get, you get an extra point. If it's a level two alliance, it's two points. And a level three alliance, you get three points. You can have up to five alliances. Lastly, you also get one extra point per turn for every suzerain you have with a city-state. Ignoring city-states, if I was in a level 4 government with five level 3 alliances going, I could get 19 points in per turn. That's sort of the, the, the maximum diplomatic favour you can get for buying all of the votes. Envoys obviously increase that. Now there are of course ways you can improve it and, and sort of change how you're looking at this, but it's all about getting as much favour as you can. There is however a secret to diplomatic victories and it is all about carbon recapture. This one government or uh, city project that you can do once you unlock the global warming mitigation civic which is way down in the future era so right at the end of the culture tree or the civic tree carbon recapture will win you the game. Uh, it is basically a city project that reduces your carbon output and then earns you 30 diplomatic favour per turn. Combine this with future civic, which is the last civic in the civic tree way into the future era. By completing this, you also get 50 diplomatic favour per turn, as well as another governor title. So these two things are really, really important. People often think that gold is the most important way of getting diplomatic favour because you can buy and sell with the AI. It's not. It's absolutely not. Culture is the most important thing because if we go right to the end of the civic tree, there is future civic, so you can see it's going to that's going to give us 50 diplomatic favour every time we complete it, which is good considering the maximum we can realistically get is 19 per turn just from the base game of having all the alliances and having the government. And then somewhere in these five policies as well, normally it's in one of the latter, the second sort of wave, but sometimes it gets put in the first one, is this carbon recapture project and that that will just massively just beeline and accelerate how much diplomatic favour we can win per turn. In May 2020, there were loads of updates that were put through onto Civ 6 about how diplomatic victories worked. You could say I was holding this guide on just purely for that update, although conveniently the update changed things <laughs> before I filmed it, so that was really good. But there are all kinds of ways you can now lose diplomatic favour. For a long time, causing grievances with other people, with other AIs, will start to reduce how much diplomatic favour per turn you, you leak effectively. So grievances are caused by everything to do with settling and converting city, religious cities of AIs that have told you not to, uh, attacking their city-states, and then obviously denouncing war, capturing cities, raising cities, holding on to cities. Anything like that can also cause grievances. If you have more grievances than everybody else in the world, and it runs on a sort of percentage basis, so if you go over the average in terms of how many grievances you get, you start to lose diplomatic favour per turn. And as anybody who has ever gone for a domination victory will tell you, this can begin to just actually accumulate up into and including a minus 20 diplomatic favour per turn penalty. So if you're going domination, getting a diplomatic victory is nigh on impossible. As of May 2020, they also included a original, uh, what did they call it, original capital uh, holding penalty. Uh, we'll, we'll have a look at that in a little bit, but essentially every single one of the civs in this game has a capital, including us, which means there are six capitals of a game in which I own one of them and there are five more. For every capital I am currently holding that is not my own, I lose five favour per turn. Now that is in addition to the excess grievance penalty. If I were to take over three capitals and I've got excess grievances for doing so, then that's immediately a minus 35 penalty. Minus 20 from excess grievances and then another minus 15 for having three capitals. So 
we can't take the capitals of the AI. It doesn't matter if we go to war with people and we take their cities, that's, that's one thing, but holding onto their capital? Big no-no. The other way we can lose it is climate change. If I start pumping CO2 emissions into the planet, and you can do that from anything from coal, oil and nuclear power plants, and then also the maintenance of units that use oil, coal or uranium, they all burn it per turn, those CO2 emissions get put into the planet and if I am producing more than the average amount of CO2 in the game, I start to get a carbon emission penalty. Again, that goes up to minus 20. So if you've got the minus 20 penalty from carbon emissions, you've got the minus 20 penalty from excess grievances, and then you've also got a couple of capitals. It's easy to get minus 40 to minus 60 penalties per turn of diplomatic favor. It makes it impossible to win the game, and we've got to avoid that. So getting a diplomatic victory it basically means we've got to be really clever about how we play the game to basically not piss anybody off drastically. So we've spoken about the main ways you can earn it by having government, city-states and alliances and then the main ways you lose it such as grievances, carbon emissions and owning people's capitals. But that's not the only ways, there are other ways you can do it as well. Obviously gold, luxuries and any other item you can trade such as uh, strategic resources can be traded for diplomatic favour as long as you have less than 10 points uh, in the diplomatic points. We'll go into diplomatic points in a second because this is obviously what we're aiming towards. So up into so the first half of the game effectively, one, once you get up to 10 points, you can be trading with the AI up to 20 diplomatic favour per turn per AI. That gets a little bit complicated, but we can go into that in a little bit more detail. So having lots of gold and lots of tradable luxuries is obviously a good thing. Emergencies are the second way of getting this favour. By partaking and then being victorious in various sorts of emergencies, from city-state emergencies to alliance breaking or betrayal emergencies. Um, we've got uh, emergencies to do with natural disasters and recovery, war, um, if somebody gets declared on, funding war. Wars. We've also got, if Sweden is in the game, um, there are world's fairs of all kinds of bits and, and um, Nobel prizes. There are all kinds of emergencies that can kick in. When these things appear in the game, you've got to have a look at them over on the left. You want to, you want to basically engage in every single emergency you can, generally speaking. Um, and that you have a look on the left, you can have a look at the victories that you get if you rank as gold, silver or bronze, and often you get diplomatic favour. Sometimes you can either go straight through and get diplomatic points as well, so that's quite exciting. So what's it all about? Why are we buying diplomatic favour? Well, it's because we're after diplomatic points. A diplomatic victory is simple. The first person to 20 points at the end of the turn in which they have obtained 20 points, you win a diplomatic victory. Diplomatic points can be earned in all kinds of ways. Emergencies is a good example of them. Sometimes if you win an emergency, you can earn a diplomatic point or two. Otherwise, the main way is via the World Congress. As soon as we go through the game into the medieval era, the World Congress begins to meet every 30 turns. There are two policies that are elected in every World Congress that gets you to vote on anything from the speed of which you can pr produce units to luxuries that should be banned or given multiple stacks of improvements to city-state trading policies. There's all kinds of stuff that comes up and we can go into that a little bit as we go through the game. If you win or you vote on a policy that is successful, you get a diplomatic point. So in the first few World Congress votes, you can earn up to two points per World Congress. Having a large amount of diplomatic favour per vote effectively gives you more influence on the international stage and it makes it more likely that you are going to be able to win a vote. Votes are difficult. It is easier to vote at the beginning when you have less diplomatic favour than it is to put loads of votes on when you have more diplomatic favour. And that's because everybody gets a free vote on everything that goes through. And after that point, buying an additional vote costs you more diplomatic favour. The next vote is worth 10 favour. The next one after that is worth 20, and then another 30, and then 40, then 50. So if you wanted 10 votes, for instance, you've got to earn the equivalent of diplomatic favour that is 10 plus 20 plus 30 plus 40 plus 50 plus 60 plus 70 plus 80 plus 90, which is 450 diplomatic favour to get 10 votes. It can be quite difficult to sort of 
rig a vote so much that you're always going to win. So it's all about being a little bit clever. We want to vote on things we know we're going to win, and we want to vote on things we know that somebody with a lot of favour is going to go and vote for, so we can kind of piggyback on the thing that wins and then get the diplomatic points that way. The other way of getting diplomatic victory points are techs and civics. Right at the end of the tech tree, and um, this is one of the hidden ones in the future era, is seasteads. This, for instance, gives you one victory point. Global warming mitigation, which we've spoken about before because it unlocks the carbon recapture project, also awards one diplomatic victory point. The diplomatic victory resolution is another additional way. Once you get later through the game, the World Congress introduces a new vote, a third vote, where if you win the vote, you can either win or lose two diplomatic victory points in addition to the ones being won. There is also another extra points if you vote on the policy that ends up winning. So in theory, it is possible to get a maximum of five points from a diplomatic or sort of a World Congress vote. You winning both of the regular two votes, you winning this third diplomatic victory, and then you being the person that earns the two from that vote. You following me? There are a lot of different ways to get these victory points and it doesn't get any more, it's just complicated. It's always complicated. But that's not even it. If we go into the Renaissance era of the tech tree, we find the Patala Palace, or specifically as I like to call it, the Potato Palace. Building this wonder, which has to be on a hill adjacent to a mountain, that's pretty easy to find if you, if you look around enough, you get one diplomatic victory point. This is a really, really good wonder to build for this victory, and specifically if you're trying to stop somebody else from winning this victory, building the palace is a good idea. The Statue of Liberty is an even better wonder. This thing uh, is all the way into civil engineering, which by the way is industrial era in the civics tree. The Statue of Liberty gets plus four diplomatic victory points when you build it. That's incredible. If you build both wonders, that is a plus five victory points towards your win. You only need 20 to win. So that's like quarter of the way there already. So you're thinking to yourself, okay, Ryan, that's great. We've got loads of ways of earning diplomatic favor. We've got loads of ways of earning the victory points, but how do we build our cities? How do we go about actually building an empire that thrives off this? Well, as in every single sort of victory type, certain districts are more important than others. The theater square is well, yeah, I would say one of two districts which is the most important of the game. Two districts stand out, the theatre square is one of them. You should have a district of the theatre square in every single city you, you build. Every single one you should have a theatre square. And the reason is, is that we need the culture. You need as much culture as you can get. So you're building, uh, you're getting great people from all the points, writers, artists, musicians, you want all of those things. You're getting all the adjacency bonuses you can get. You're getting all of the yields from all of the buildings that you put in, the art museums, film studios, the amphitheatres, all that sort of thing. You're building up as much culture as you can get so that you can race along this civic street as much as you can. Because you need to be in the future era. In order to win a diplomatic victory, you must go to the future era. That's where all the points are, are hidden. It is so important you go for culture. Culture is so important. It is more important than science for a diplomatic victory. This is where people get hung up. People are so used to going on science as the most important thing. It's not. Not in this game. You need to get a theatre square in every city. Equally important is the industrial zone, which is always important in pretty much every single game you play. An industrial zone should be also built in every single city you produce. Not for the usual reasons. If you were going for a min-max sort of perfect deity run, it's all about jumping on the coal power plant and having huge adjacency bonuses, but we're not going to be going anywhere near coal power plants this particular game. Why? Because the CO2 is appalling on coal and we don't want the carbon emissions penalty. What we do, however, want is an industrial zone so that later in the game we can do the carbon recapture project. Now to do that, as we described before, where you get all of the diplomatic favour for completing it every time, you can only do it in a city that has an industrial zone. So every single city we've got needs one of these so that at the end of the game we can just be spamming those projects left, right and centre to be earning as much favour as we can. We also want to get into a stage where we effectively are in what I like to call a carbon deficiency point of view. We want to be in a place where our contribution to CO2 levels worldwide are negative. Once we get negative, we can start to push the world below negative, so the total becomes minus and we actually start to chill the world. 
What that does is it puts the game in a state where the average CO2 that people put out is negative. So anybody else that even is putting zero out, or even if they put a little bit of carbon out, they start to get massive carbon uh, penalties, carbon emission penalties. So we can drive everybody else's diplomatic favor down. By creating that unique environment, by using the carbon recapture, we can get tons of extra diplomatic favor, and we penalize the AI so that they actually all have negative. You're gonna win every vote. It's, it's perfectly beautiful. This is why it is so important to get as much culture as you can get, and then having industrial zone in every city as well. Holy sites are obviously important for religious victories, but also for culture victories. They're also quite important for a diplomatic victory. Really, you, you don't need a religion to get a diplomatic victory. Some people would argue that it is totally irrelevant. I believe, however, it's quite important because you need a religion so that when people who start to spread their religion start to spread it into your lands, which they will inevitably do at some point because the AI wants to win a religious victory and their apostles will end up going everywhere. You want a religion so that you can use your diplomatic favor to go to an AI and say, hey, stop spreading your religion. If they don't, you can gain huge grievance, like points against them. They generate grievances for you. And it means you can go to war and steal their cities without generating a diplomatic penalty or a grievance penalty with the world. It is so important you do that. Also, of the, the May and June uh, 2020 updates to Civ 6, religions have become a lot better. And we're going to be using a religion to gain even more culture than we would normally be doing, as well as improving the growth in our cities, which is really important. Population is always king. Finally, and this is technically the aqueduct we are playing as Rome, so this time it's called the bath. The aqueducts are also important and you should be building them in every city. Unlike other districts, they do not count towards the district maximum limit in your city, so you can always build an aqueduct even if you've built as many other districts as you can. So a population four city, for instance, can have two districts, so if you've got a industrial zone and you've got a theatre square, for instance, in most cities, you can still build a bath or an aqueduct. And the reason you want one of these is because of the adjacency bonus it gives to industrial zones. It also gives you a huge amount of extra food. Uh, it gives you an amenity in a lot of cities as well. So you can get up to six housing. Um, you also get a if built adjacent to a GFM or Fisher. That's quite difficult to do actually. But it's the housing and just having one of these things. It's really, really good. The fact that Rome has baths just makes this even better. Commercial hubs and harbours are good districts. You never want to be building both, realistically. Yes, they do sync up and you can get adjacency bonuses, for instance, if you have a harbour next to a commercial hub. I do understand that gives more gold, but you should really only have one or the other because the market and the lighthouse buildings, which are respective to each district, they give you plus one trade route capacity as long as you haven't also got the other buildings. If you build a market, you get a plus one trade route. If you build a lighthouse, then after, you don't get a second trade route. So there's no point really doubling up. Trade routes are good. The more trade routes you have, the more gold you get, and gold you can use to buy diplomatic favor. But as of the updates when the computer stops trading you diplomatic points or diplomatic favors, once your points go over 10, the gold is less important than it is than it previously was at the late stages of the game. It's a useful asset, but it's not game breaking. So you want to be getting like maybe one of these districts in each of your cities, but maybe get to sort of five or six trade routes if you can as a minimum. It's not it's not essential. You should always look to build campuses, specifically campuses that give a plus three adjacency bonus, because later we're going to be going for the rationalism policy card, which improves the science drastically of any city with plus three um, adjacency and also 10 population. It's always something to keep an eye on. So campuses, if you can see a plus three adjacency spot, then go for it. But you don't need to beeline and rush them like in other strategies. Encampments are quite situational. If you've got an AI attacking you, encampments with uh, ancient walls in the city provide amazing distraction for fighting the AI. They hate encampments. The amount of times they will throw horsemen, knights, swordsmen, musketmen just aimlessly at the walls of an encampment rather than attacking your army, they, they, it's just ridiculous. Even a deity AI with an overwhelming army, if you stick an encampment in the way, half the time it'll just distract them. So these things can be good. I would personally wait uh, until later, until you can get military academies. Once you get that building, you can build cores and armies outright, and then they get really good. 
Otherwise, you've got to think, I'm using one of the districts the city can build to build this encampment. Is it worth it? Often, the answer is no. Aerodromes? Maybe build one or two across your empire at the late stages of the game to get a couple of fighters or bombers. Really good defensive units, but we're not going to war. And as long as we hold um, the diplomatic game and, and make friends with all of the AIs, which we're going to be trying to do, not essential, not essential. Don't get too hung up on dams. They're quite expensive to build. You don't get a huge bonus from them. Um, the AI likes to send spies to breach them, which is a little bit annoying. They do give adjacencies to industrial zones. That can be quite good, but they're expensive. Don't plan an empire around them. If you are building a spaceport, you're wasting your time. This is the wrong victory type for you. And lastly, the entertainment complex. You don't build it. Never build this. Also the water park. Don't build the water park until you get all the way to natural history in the industrial era. At that point, you unlock the zoo and you unlock the aquarium. Those buildings make the water park and the entertainment district worth building. Until that point, it is not. An improved um, entertainment complex with a arena in it, for instance, will give you two amenities. I mean, for the sake of it, just trade with an AI and get a luxury from them. It'll have double the effect of that. The problem with diplomatic victories is that we cannot cause excess grievances to the AI. Because of that, we can't aggressively spread our religion to those who don't want it, although there are tricks around that we're going to keep an eye on. And we can't go to war and capture people's capitals and have excess grievances. Because of that, I mean, Pingala is good. The extra science and extra culture is important, especially this connoisseur. We want a, an improved Pingala with connoisseur in our highest population city when we can get it. But the most important one for us at the beginning of the game is Magnus. The reason being is we need to get as many cities out as possible, as quickly as possible, so that when the AI begins to spread, we don't have to go to war with them. The map is only so big. There is only so much space for cities and the AI will spread their cities around. We need to get there first. Specifically, we need to get provision up and running so that our settlers cannot preserve consume population when we build them. It means our cities can spam them out and we can settle all around the map. It's really, really important that we get as many cities out as we can, especially because in Civ 6 there is no penalty to culture or science, the number of cities you have. You literally are encouraged to build as many as you can. And what we need as high as culture as possible. M more cities equal more monuments, more theatre squares, and more space for our religion to give us more uh, culture. So because of that, in most cases, I would suggest you go for Magnus and Provision first. Once you've got Provision, then switch over to Mangala and get Connoisseur up and running. For this particular playthrough, and I would suggest this with all diplomatic playthroughs, we are going to be beelining for Astrology, because you want to pick up that holy site as quickly as you can, so that you can get a religion as quick as you can. The quicker you get a religion, the faster you can shotgun your particular beliefs. And there are some brilliant pantheons and brilliant beliefs to help you through the early stages of the game. Otherwise, um, science-wise, basically you kind of pick sciences in the first sort of classical and ancient eras to basically get what you need to get. Yes, if you've got some really good adjacency spots, then pick up campuses, but otherwise I would focus on getting pottery, animal husbandry, mining and bronze working up pretty quickly. Um, that unlocks horses and iron, so you can see them on the map. Uh, masonry you want to keep an eye on so that you can build ancient walls in case people attack you, that's always important. But otherwise, you are beelining realistically towards industrial zones. You need to get three mines up, you need to get a trade route up, and you need to meet another civilization to get all of the boosts towards these techs that you need to, to well, basically continue. Killing a unit with a slinger and building a pasture also helps with that. It's really important that you look at these Eurekas, by the way. Really, really. It, it, it takes 40% of the cost of any tech off, and we're not going to have a crazy science output this game. So we need to make use of the science we've got to basically hang on and make sure we're mid-table all game. The mid-stage of the game, once we've got apprenticeship, we're going to go up here through education to beeline towards astronomy as quickly as we can. That lets us get the Patala Palace, which is really, 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 really important. We love the Patala Palace. Otherwise, science-wise, there's not a huge amount that we need to worry about getting. Yes, there are some really good wonders out there if you look for them. The Kilwa Kilaswani 
<laughs> which is machinery, god oh, sorry that was really appalling, gives more envoys, and envoys are really really important to this game because we need to be getting as many city states as we can. That's a good wonder to have. Forbidden City is always a good wonder as well, that wildcard policy slot really helps, but otherwise there's not a huge amount that you need to be really worried on. Up until the point where you get right towards the edge of the game and you unlock things like solar farms and wind farms. These things are going to get you most of your power, because we're not going to have much power, because we're not going to be burning anything. Eventually the future area, obviously there's a science um, that you can unlock once you get to seasteads, which gives you one diplomatic point. You're not going to rely on that though. Civics is where it's really, really at. Realistically, we want to be going towards state workforce pretty quickly to pick up the government plaza, which you want to build um, once we've got a government so that we can get um, the Ancestral Hall. That means we can get settlers out quicker in the game, which is really, really handy. Um, and also gives us the two government titles to get provision on Magnus really quickly. Otherwise, Drama and Poetry is really important we beeline for because that unlocks the Theatre Square. And then after that, well, until we get to Civil Engineering, where we want to fa focus on getting the Statue of Liberty, you want to keep an eye on governments to make sure you've always got the, the best government you can to get the diplomatic favour from that. You want to be keeping an eye on civil service so that we can get alliances as quickly as we can as well. That's really important that we do that. But the main thing is envoys. We want to be going through the civic street to unlock as many envoys as we can because we want to be suzerain with as many city-states as we can. Once we meet city-states as well, we always, always want to be doing as many quests for them as we can get. Because if we can do quests, well, that's brilliant. We get more envoys and we're likely to have more suzerains. Oh, there it is in the technology tree. Sorry, sanitation. This is a really good one under uh, the Orzaza Graz. Uh, it's a difficult tongue twister, but that is extra diplomatic favour for every suzerain you have, or every city state you have. If you've got five or six of them, then that's a lot of diplomatic favour per turn. Again, it's kind of like a, a nice but not essential. It's better you focus on the Potato Palace, or the Patala Palace, I get into the habit of calling it Potato Palace now, and the Statue of Liberty. They're the most important ones. Otherwise, focus on getting luxury and strategic resources so that you can trade them for diplomatic favour and then later gold. Really important. When it comes to pantheons, I would always suggest get one as quickly as you can. God King is your friend, uh, and Holy Sites your friend in order to get that extra faith really important you get a pantheon as quickly as you can. There are lots and lots of good options. Anything that gives you more faith is always good. Extra culture is really good as well. We're going to be using a couple that hopefully blend well with our particular playstyle. Um, but yeah, it's always worth getting a pantheon. I would always recommend it. In terms of city-states, we want to be making friends with as many as we possibly can. That goes without saying. Um, industrial city-states are quite good to be friends with because obviously building uh, workshops and factories later in the game really helps, but cultural city-states are the ones we really want to be focused on because we're going to be building a lot of theatre squares and we want as much culture as we can. There are some really good culture city-states out there. If they appear, jump on them. Really important. Equally as well, you want to be friends with any city-state that is likely going to be killed by an AI, uh, killed by an AI, uh, that you can possibly, dip, well, with, with a bit of force, um, liberate if it gets taken over. The liberation bonus you get for doing that and the diplomatic favour you get for doing that, oh, massive. Really, really important. Otherwise, when we look at starting a diplomatic victory game, our turn one choices are kind of similar to how they always are. I always say you want to be looking out for as many four yield tiles as possible. At the moment, we've actually got one, two, three, but I can see, no, four. Um, it's not a brilliant start. There's no huge like four or five food yield tiles that sometimes you can get. We've got a single rice. We do have a river. We've got a couple of mountains. It's nothing to write home about though. Um, if I were to settle here, I would have the uh, river, so the extra housing that I could do from that, which is really cool. Um, can't complain about that. I would settle with one four yield tile. I wouldn't have access to the sea, which is a little bit unfortunate. I do have access to a lake. Um, I mean, it, it's a good enough place as any, to be fair. I mean, the alternatives would be going towards this or this pearls in order to get a little bit more faith per turn at the beginning, but we'd sacrifice a lot of the fresh water and a lot of the good yield tiles. The tundra up here is not great, but we can always build on top of that. It's all um, tundra hills as well, or tundra forest, which is really, really good. We've got a couple of luxuries, but nothing crazy. Yeah, it's not a start to write home against, but that's okay. 
We don't mind if we have a fantastic start or not, because we're going to win anyway, because this guide is not start dependent. So, I'm going to settle Rome down, let we get the extra era score by settling near a city that can flood, but don't forget, it won't flood as long as you are on top of a hill, um, which is quite handy actually, so that all this will flood, but not, not Rome itself. Um, Never forget about pins as well. Pins are really, or map tacks, are really, really important that you put as many of these down on the map as you can because it holds a coherent strategy together and makes sure that you don't forget anything. But that is as much as you need to hear from me. I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to start playing. So join me as we go through this game and we hopefully win a diplomatic victory with ease. See you in a bit. And finally, a very special shout out goes to Scott Stratton for all of the help you give on Patreon, as well as everybody else who likes and subscribes to the video. Cheers, you help keep me going.